Good morning or good afternoon if you're on the East Coast like me. It's one o'clock on a Sunday and it is beautiful outside. I'm late. We did this unscheduled because my schedule is starting to change around a lot now. We're getting into spring and the boys are having more sports. And uh, so I'm going to jump on these Sundays anytime I can. I might not necessarily be planned, uh, but... You can expect to see me. I just don't know exactly when. So if you're catching the replay of this, uh, I understand that uh, it's going to be random and you're not going to be able to catch it live. So we're cool there. Um, how's everything going? This uh, coronavirus thing is still going on, huh? Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I see so many different things. In fact, on my uh, Instagram story, and actually I think it shows up on my Facebook story too, there's a doctor out there, Dr. Merkula, that I don't follow very much, um, kind of loosely, I guess, um, since I've been following Dr. Perlmutter, who wrote The Grain Brain. And um, Dr. Merkula interviewed somebody that um, says the coronavirus was a bioweapon that was produced in Wuhan. And uh, he says he has evidence and, you know, there's a lab there and all this other stuff and it got out. And he also asserts that SARS was a bioweapon also. I don't know. I can't decide if Merkula saying it makes it more credible or it makes him less credible. Uh, you know, I, does anybody really even know? Uh, I, I think that maybe that, you know, if somebody sus is suspicious of where it originated from, that could be why. You know, while some people are saying, hey, it's, you know, the flu, basically, more people die of this than coronavirus and all this other stuff. But it would also explain why um, people like Italy is shutting off the entire northern half of the country or nor northern third of the country. You know, are they overreacting or are they, do they know something that they just want to stop it, right? Kind of like China did or tried to do. I don't know if they were successful or not. Um, good morning, Carrie. Thanks for joining me. Um, but you know, it's funny, like, you know, they say that only so many people were infected, but then every time somebody gets off a plane, gets tested and tests positive, I think, well, if only this small amount of people were infected, how did this person on the plane get in contact with those people? So I feel like, uh, I feel like, I feel like it's just, uh, you know, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's bigger than we know because nobody's been tested. Um, and I wonder if that's the case, then it brings down the death rate to something normal like uh, the cold or a flu. Um, although the fact that it spreads so rapidly, especially in the older population, is a little bit scary. So if you have parents or grandparents out there that that might have even some uh, issues, that's kind of a big deal. I mean, that 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 uh, care home in, in Washington State, that's, that's a scary situation. It, like, it can just wipe out people that way. Uh, Gemma, uh, believe this virus has been around a while because they had it in their lab. The government tells us, never tells us the truth. You know, it's funny. I, I don't want to be paranoid, um, but you know, you got to assume that the government, no matter who it is, um, you know, their first job is to stop panic, you know? So, if they don't want people running to the stores buying everything up the way they have been doing, um, you know, imagine what it would be like if there was actually something to worry about. People would be going nuts right now. Um, so I'm I'm still taking the same approach that I have been taking. You know, like keeping a more of a supply of stuff in my house, but trying not to go overboard with any of it. You know, if we need to, we can survive for a couple of weeks in here, and not because I believe that the zombie apocalypse is going to happen, but only because if, if it turns out there's an outbreak, I'd like to stay inside for as long as I can and avoid as much exposure as I can. And, you know, my kids are still in school and, you know, whatever happens, happens. Um, but I'm going to try to avoid it any way I can. That said, I mean, like, look, there's major events being canceled. South by South by Southwest is canceled. Um, even I got an email from Allegiant saying that if I wanted to cancel my plane ticket that I have in a couple of weeks, they're not going to charge me for it which for Allegiance kind of a big deal because they charge you for everything. So, you know, I, it's something we're all trying to deal with. And, you know, I'm just glad, like a lot of people are having a hard time getting things from China. All of our stuff, most of our stuff is produced in the United States. 
Um, and the stuff that is produced in China, we just don't have in stock anymore. So, you know, we're doing, we're doing okay because all of our stuff comes from like 20 minutes away, which I find reassuring. Cause if anything were coming from China, I feel like we'd have to lice all the whole box. And I don't even know that it can live on a, on a, a package like that, but I feel like I'd have to take, take that under consideration anyway. Hi, Linda. How are you? So are you guys doing anything for this whole coronavirus thing? Is there anything like, are you doing extra anything? I know I saw somebody posted the other day that you kind of live out in the woods a little bit and, you know, lucky you. <laughs> I don't, I want to live close to the city until something like this happens. And then I want to be as far away as possible. Um, you know, gas up the four by four. Let's be ready to go. <laughs> um in reality, many people die every year from the flu. People should be washing their hands. Yeah, so that's a very good point, right? So I agree with that statement, and I, I disagree with the way some people wield that statement. So I agree. You know, wash your hands. I mean, there are far too many people that I see walk out of the bathroom not washing their hands. I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, you know, we used to have a guy, when we had an office building for my IT company, we didn't have an office building. We rented an office building. There was a like a credit bureau, uh, credit company or maybe a credit repair company next door to us. And there was this guy whose name was Nick. Uh, would um, we we saw that he would leave the urinal and not wash his hands and walk straight out. But we soon realized that he was actually sitting down for his morning constitutional. Um, and like if we'd be in the bathroom and he would walk out of the stall, he would just make a beeline for the door. He would never wash his hands. That's disgusting. That's disgusting. And, um, you know, I, I can't, I don't even know where to go. Like, how does anybody even rationalize that? Like, you got to wash your hands. You got to wash your hands. Um, and, and we even started to notice that his coffee cup, um, he would put his coffee cup on the floor in the bathroom. And that to me just is like too much. <laughs> I'm like, oh God. So what happened was the chiropractor's office around the corner, uh, they heard about it. And um, the secretary was so disgusted or the uh, receptionist, whatever she is. Um, she printed up a note and uh, they hung it inside the door in the men's room and wrote, um, you know, wash your hands after using the restroom. Um, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever, we know who you are. <laughs> and so that didn't work. Um, they, uh, they, he still like with that letter, like he would, he would literally, uh, walk out of the bathroom, pick his coffee mug, pick his cup coffee mug off the floor, walk out of the stall, walk straight out of the bathroom, straight past that sign and just no shame, no shame at all. Um, I don't understand it. Don't understand it. It's crazy. I see it in the gym too. Like, they have, they ask you to wash your hands. They ask you to clean off the equipment when you're done with it. Uh, and you see those people that just get up and walk. And like, I mean, I'm sure there are other people that are observing that and seeing that. Like, and just like, like, how do you do that? I don't care. If you don't care about your own hygiene, fine. But care about other people's. Like, don't spread this stuff. There was a woman uh, that the CDC was monitoring for the coronavirus in the very beginning of this. And they told her to self-quarantine. And she got on a plane. They couldn't get in contact with her all weekend. And when she finally called back like the next Monday or Tuesday, uh, they asked where she had been. And she's like, oh, yeah, I had a plane ticket. I went to Minnesota or something. And they're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Like, like we got to be a little bit responsible. And look, I don't want to go overboard, but we can't disregard all of it. You know, like if you feel if there's a chance you might be carrying the flu, if you're exposed to the flu, you know, you take extra precautions. Uh, if you're exposed to the coronavirus, maybe you take some extra precautions, especially because government entities are. And, um, you know, I mean, I wouldn't want to feel responsible if I gave it to somebody that ended up passing away. Not that I can control whether I get it or not, but I can minimize my risks to a degree, right? I mean, there's sure there's a level of diminishing returns, but we can minimize the risk, you know, through washing hands or maybe avoiding trips that we don't need to go on, stuff like that. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, my, we yesterday, and this is actually 
what I wanted to talk about today mainly. Um, hey, Alfred, uh, I don't have any feedback for you on a possible vaccine or cure. I don't know about that. That's, that's way out of my uh, way out of my jurisdiction or, or knowledge base. Um, I, you know, all I got to do is, uh, yeah, I, all I got to all I got to say is you know, wash your hands and, and avoid sneezing on anybody and try not to let anybody sneeze on you. That's kind of where I'm, I'm avoiding confined spaces, large groups, that sort of thing. Um, but what I wanted to talk about today was um, yesterday we watched as a family the movie Ford versus Ferrari, which is about the um, Matt, Matt Damon plays Carol Shelby and it's about um, him helping to design the GT40 that won Le Mans in uh, France in, I think, 65 through 69. Uh, it's a beautiful car, beautiful race car. And it's funny because they reference it not being as pretty as the Ferraris, but I actually like it better. It's just a simple design that was really fast. And they dominated it for four years. And the new GT um, that's out right now is a beautiful car too. Uh, but it started like this, this like racing legacy uh, for Ford. And also Carroll Shelby was already kind of a legend in his own right at that time, but this just launched him into another level. Uh, and then he did the Shelby Mustangs and all the other stuff that happened. But what struck me in watching this movie were the three main characters in here. Um, and they might like, so Carroll Shelby is the main character, right? And then you have his friend, uh, um, uh, Ken Miles, who's the driver, and uh, you know, and then you have Henry Ford II, who's obviously running Ford. And the the interactions uh, that these characters have, you know, Ford never really has connections with Miles, but Shelby's kind of the middleman, and so Miles is like this almost irresponsible um, driver that like has no filter, just says whatever he wants to say throws wrenches at people like he's just like that off the wall character but he's incredibly talented shelby's this guy who in the movie um has a heart problem um he's probably in his mid 40s at that point i believe um and uh he had won Le Mans himself which is why ford comes to him uh but he uh you know he's he's always striking this balance between um you know uh, how to like who to who to appease you know between ken and ford and, um, so he, he's like, and he's in the space where he like, he needs to make money. Like he owes uh, the Ford motor company money for engines he's purchasing. He's, he's selling the same car three times to three different people. You know, like he's constantly going through a, a, like a, like he, at that moment he's going through like troubles and he's trying to, trying to get somewhere. Ford on the other hand is, uh, running a company that, um, you know, he's, he's it, it, Ford's in the middle of a downturn uh, for like three years. And in the opening scene of this movie, you know, he shuts down the plant and tells everybody to go home and think about what they can do to make Ford a better company. And if they don't come in with a good idea, they're going to be fired because they're second rate, blah, 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 blah. And so it's a, it's, it's a, they go, the characters are polar opposites uh, in some regard. And, and you see like the interactions, like you have Henry Ford is this entitled, um, you know, you know, he's worried about his legacy more than he's worried about the people. Um, he, he talks to people with such disrespect. Um, and he just orders people around and he has like all these, like, uh, oh, I can't say the word that I want to say right now, but he, he's got these lackeys that just kind of like suck up to him, right? These yes men, and like, there's just these levels of bureaucracy in Ford. Ford did not come off like Ford. The company didn't come off very well in this movie. Um, and he just, he just seems like this guy that I would never want to work for. Right. He just, he cares about himself, his legacy, his prestige, you know, his, all that stuff is all he cares about. And he just talks to people with such disrespect and he orders them around and he points for them where to sit. Like there's this scene with Shelby where he's just points to for him to sit down and then you know he says come here like he's just he's just always demanding people do things for him well uh, and it's it's i i 
try to figure out how a guy like Shelby can live within that environment. You know, like at what point do you say, you know, enough is enough. I don't, you know, I respect myself more than, you know, allowing you to, you know, treat me this way. Right. And, uh, but he walks the line really well, you know, even when he's talking with Ford, he talks with him, frankly, he talks with him with like a little bit of humor, uh, but sets, I think boundaries, but he knows when he's talking with these guys that they are always going to try to, you know, kick him in the nuts, I think is what he says, or something like that at some, like he knows it's coming. Like these guys are, are like leeches or like, you know, they just, they just somehow latch on or try to like position themselves to be better than you or, or in, to gain a, a position of advantage. And, um, but he navigates it pretty well. And in the end result, you don't see it in the movie. The end result is he has a, he becomes a legend. And I would say probably a bigger figure in automotive history than Henry Ford II ever did. Um, you know, I mean, the guy, I think even at the end of the movie, they say was one of the most successful race car designers in the world. And his products are legendary legendary and Ford is still using you know the his name now the the Shelby Cobra the GT500 just came out um so I mean he's a he's a valuable name um and he's just a legend in in racing um you know but so how he navigated with that like you have to have a, a lot of self-confidence to navigate relationships like that but it's also got to be incredibly exhausting I I just I don't know I don't know how I could continuously do that, you know, like how, how you could continuously try to deal with people. I guess it's a fact of life. And I, you know, we come across those people all of our lives. Uh, but on the flip side of it, you have Ken Miles, the driver who doesn't put up with anybody. In the beginning of the movie, there's a customer that says, you know, I don't like the way my car runs now after you fixed it. And Ken says, well, you know, this is the way it's supposed to be. It's a sports car. You're just not the right driver for the car. You know, like it's always like, like he doesn't, he says whatever, you know, he throws a wrench at one point at Shelby. Um, he, he just says things. And the whole, the whole movie is about Ford's guys not liking Ken Miles because he just says whatever he says and he's not a Ford guy. Right. Um, and you know, the tragic part of this is that, you know, he, he's, he's incredibly talented, but he he shoots himself in the foot so often because he can't keep his mouth shut because he's so reactive and because he's so you know like he, he he's so uncompromising with everything that he does and says you know it makes him the best race car driver in the world at that point but he can't capitalize on all of that talent because he can't shut up, you know? And so the only reason he's actually still like involved is because Shelby is, you know, such good friends with this guy. But the two actually can never be equals because Miles keeps putting himself at a at this dis like this disadvantage. And so they can't have this this proper relationship, uh, if you will. Um and, and it's and it's and it's kind of sad, you know, I mean, he gets, he gets screwed out of a lot of stuff in this process. And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure the movie was written to be more dramatic than real life, you know, with all of its nuances probably was. Uh, but, you know, I, they may have captured the essence of Henry Ford and Ken Miles, um, where, you know, Henry Ford was a spoiled brat who didn't take responsibility for his own company. You know, he didn't take responsibility for the fact that it was slumping. He blamed it on everybody working for him. It wasn't him. Who is he to be responsible for the downturn in his company's sales? This is Ford Motor Company, right? That's, that's such a toxic way of thinking. Um, you know, and, and, you know, sending everybody home. If you guys don't want, if you don't come with a good idea, stay home, don't come back you know, second rate, blah, 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 whatever he berated them with. Just a terrible, terrible leadership style. Uh, and you have Ken Miles, who's almost, you know, very similar in that, you know, doesn't take responsibility for his own stuff, shoots himself in the foot. Um, you know, it's it's not quite the same perspective, but very similar in the way of working. And then you have, 
Shelby, who can navigate between these two guys and all of the other people he's trying to navigate through to become a successful person himself. And now, you know, like thinking back to like, you can do whatever you want. Looking at these three guys, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, where if you want to be the richest person in the world, you have to act like the richest person in the world. You have to sacrifice a lot of things, relationships, possibly your ethics, uh, your time, your free time, your, your distractions, your, your, you know, whatever you do, you know, you, to be the richest person in the world, you might have to work 18 hours a day or more, right? Seven days a week, never take a vacation, you know, compromise, you know, what you, what you want to buy for yourself to like, to whatever you need to do. Right. And that's sort of what Henry Ford did, right? He was born with the money, but he compromised his reputation as a person, like as a, as a, you know, he compromised, you know, he, he treated people a certain way. And on the same side, Ken Miles didn't want to compromise any of his perspective. He was rock solid in his perspective that like, this is the way it is. And no matter how much it damages my life, I'm not going to change. I'm going to say whatever I want to say, and I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And you know, the IRS can seize my, my property, the, you know, I'm going to lose jobs. I'm going to be broke. All the stuff that happens to him because he can't be somewhat compromising or open to the idea that he might be wrong. So both of these people on opposite ends, maybe opposite ends of the spectrum, can't see that they have issues in their lives. And, and why would Henry Ford even want to? He's loaded and he probably lived a comfortable life no matter how successful Ford was, right? And the guy was, the guy was loaded. He was never going to lose his money. So why is there a reason for him to change? But then the, the character with the most growth is the guy in the middle, right? The guy in the middle who's up against it still talented, willing to work with different people, compromising to a point, but not enough that it breaks him. Although it does hurt his relationship with Ken, right? So, you know, at some points he has to make decisions as to whether he's going to back up Ken or go along with what Ford wants and it hurts Ken, right? And so as you're, you know, he's got to, he's got to live with those decisions in the end. And a lot of us have to do the same thing. There are things we're doing every day, you know, and it's not as grandiose, right? We're not running billion dollar companies. We're, maybe we're not broke. Maybe we're in the middle just trying to navigate this. And I think with a lot of the way we behave, it has to be in alignment with what our values are. And if we don't have a solid value system or a solid purpose laid out for ourselves, that's much harder to do. And it would be much, much more frustrating trying to navigate in between this, this push and pull that we have with the people around us. You know, the, the more clearly defined your value system is and your purpose in life is, the more you can judge the interactions you have with other people as to whether it's okay, whether it's valuable, whether it's something that you want to have or don't want to have. But we need to have that framework. That's why I'm always encouraging everyone to explore what's most important for them in their lives. Because when you do that, you know, whether you have the decision to work overtime or spend an evening with your kids or go out with the girls instead of staying out or staying staying home with the kids or you know, I'm not, and I'm not saying you can't do either or both, but what I'm saying is, is that there's, there's going to be a, like a balance and how you balance it determines your result. None of it is wrong, but you have to line it up with what you find to be important. You know, um, I went through that, you know, I went through that. I was, I was going out a few times a week. Uh, I was not spending a whole lot of time at home. I was working way too much. And it took me a long time to to figure out that that's like where I was going was not a good relationship with my kids, my wife. Um, I was going to be stressed out, burned out, unhealthy. Um, and I had to change my perspective on how I was behaving on a daily basis and align my actions daily 
with where I wanted to go. So, you know, I, I would encourage you to continuously, you're not going to figure it out today, but continuously figure out what's most important for you long term and how are your actions today aligned or not aligned with that ultimate vision of yourself. If, if you want to have a happy family, a close relationship with the people around you, what are you doing to make that happen? What are you doing to not have that happen? What are you shooting yourself in the foot? In, in what regard are you shooting yourself in the foot? If you want more money, what are you doing to get more money? What are you doing that's costing you money? Are you willing to give up some of these things? If you want, you know, you know, <laughs> close to myself, if I want a new house, what am I doing to get a new house? What am I doing that's stopping me from getting a new house? Whatever your goal is, it can be big, small, whatever. It could be a college degree. What are you doing to get the college degree? If you want to get healthier, what are you doing to get healthier? What are you doing that's stopping you from getting healthy? Put those into two different buckets. You spend more time over here with the healthy stuff and less time over here with the unhealthy stuff. And it's not that easy. I know I am not as healthy as I want to be. But it's that daily struggle of figuring it out. You know, navigating through life's struggles and trials and whatever. You know, as I was watching this movie, I related it a lot uh, to a conversation I had with uh, somebody a couple days previous where, you know, I, I, I put myself in a position where um, I was at a disadvantage. You know, I was looking to this person for help and I felt like this person um, almost was doing me a favor and helping me, which is really not. He's just doing his job. But um, I'm sure I put myself at a disadvantage socially uh, in the manner of speaking, right? And it culminated in this conversation where uh, you know, he was dismissing my questions, was uh, passive aggressive and annoyed at, at me trying to gain clarity on some things. Uh, meanwhile, the answers were coming freely from other people. Um, but this person that I was trusting in uh, was not. Um, and it got to the point where as I was pressing him because I got more suspicious and more suspicious, uh, he started talking over me. And, you know, at that point, I feel like we crossed the line and I said, stop talking over me. And then he turned it into, uh, I'm hanging up now. You need to compose yourself, which I was like, what? I'm composed. I'm starting to get a little uncomposed now that you said that. But um, it's that toxic relationship where, and that, that instant right there is when like, when you are passive aggressive, not you, but when someone is passive aggressive and then when you react to it, and they go, what's wrong with you? Why are you upset? I'm not upset. Why are you upset? And then so they like immediately shift the blame on you for the direction the conversation's going. Uh, that's toxic. Uh, that is um, not a relationship that I want to be in. Uh, and that's the type of relationship that I have strayed away from uh, in the past. And I've had that relationships with customers. You know, I've had that relationship with uh, with friends, with family, I've been, you know, still see it in other places. The difference is this. So I boil it down to this. We all need help from time to time. We have to be careful who we're asking for help from, because there is a, a group of people who will offer help and offer it graciously and do it in a manner that doesn't make you feel less than, right? You know, whether you're helping the homeless or just helping somebody, um, you know, around the house or helping somebody at work or helping a family member, like you, you have to do it in a way that is respectful and like, you know, I understand you need help. I can help you. That's great. I'm happy to do it, right? But then there's this other type of 
help where somebody like they get resentful like for helping but they still do it out of obligation and they still do it out of like you know like it's almost like a like a sales thing like where you're like you know and i relate it to uh being a salesperson like when i would when i would go into a sales call like it's like a manipulation tactic, right? And I, I probably used it because I was almost even a way, in a way trained to use it at a point in time. Um, you know, where you're, you know, you're, you want to sell yourself as somebody helping them. But, you know, but if you're not actually, if you're not actually trying to help them, if you're trying to use help as a manipulation to sell more product or as a manipulation to feel important or as a, as a manipulation to feel better than, then someone with, self-respect, boundaries, limits, um, and, and, you know, eventually maybe a, an, an, an understanding of what's going on, because a lot of times you can't even identify that it's happening. But when you start to get that feeling like, oh, this, this, this doesn't feel right, right, is when you have to decide, like, this person is not the kind of help I want, right? This is the kind of person that, um, needs to be distanced, right? And so it's not that I think we need to not ask for help from people. It's that we need to make sure we're getting help from the right people. Uh, and how you determine that is probably about how you feel when you receive the help or in the process of receiving the help. If you feel less than, if you feel that you're being talked down to, if you feel that, um, the help for you is actually less valuable than the help of the other person, like whatever the benefit is for the other person, then it's probably not the right kind of help. Right. So it's a, it's a hard thing to navigate. Um, you know, and, and, you know, and I bringing it back to the movie, you know, I think that you look at Carol Shelby and he's probably making that analysis the entire time, you know, like, I have principles, I have values, I have this friend here that that is kind of causing his own problem, but in, in his own right is, you know, I like him and he's a valuable person and I'm going to treat him with respect, even if these other people aren't. And he's navigating these snakes, you know, trying to, you know, be his own man, trying to be his, you know, who he is and accomplish something, you know, while dealing with these other people. You know, and there are points in time where you have to say, you know, no, I'm no longer in this. Or maybe you can start to, you know, if it's somebody that you can't leave, then maybe, or the loss is too great if you leave, then maybe you have to reassert a boundary and reestablish a boundary so that like things stop happening, right? Um, you know, so it's just, it's hard to navigate. It's, it's a very difficult thing to navigate. But I think it, again, all comes back to principles. It all comes back to purpose. It all comes back to the vision you have for yourself, the values you have for yourself. And I think that, you know, while, you know, the, 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 the statement that always comes to me is FU money, like people want FU money so they don't have to deal with other people's oppression or crap or whatever, right? Uh, but it's not necessarily just a monetary thing. I think it's the relationships. You know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to have to say F you to people, uh, but I just want people in my life that don't need to be told that, right? I want people in my life that, you know, where the respect goes either way. And that doesn't mean there's not misunderstandings. It doesn't mean that there's not moments of imbalance, but there's got to be moments like it can't be so out of balance that it's upsetting, right? That's, that's the key to it. Like it can't be so out of balance that somebody feels better than, right? And that's that's when things need to need to change and change quickly. Because if you continue that relationship, then if you continue being the person less than, you get sort of used to it. And you behave in a way where you put yourself in that position with a lot of other people. And people that like to feel more than identify with people that feel less than and if they like that feeling, they gravitate towards those people. So if you're putting out a less than vibe, the more thans will come to you. They're not going to come to you to lift you up. Some people will. I mean, there are other people out there that will see you and say, hey, let's go. But for the most part, like 
I feel like there's a lot more more thans than less than or a or more, lot more more thans than, you know, kind people, which is a sad statement. But and maybe there's not. Maybe it's just that these ones draw my ire more. I don't know. But, you know, I think that, you know, the couple times, like the couple times when when somebody behaves in a way where you can identify that, the sooner you can identify it and the sooner you can, sooner you can extract yourself from that situation, the better. And it's easier when you're principled, when you have values, when you have purpose, and when you have options. When you can safely say, I am not harming myself by leaving this situation, you feel much more confident in doing that. You know, you think of codependent relationships or, you know, victim relationships, like all of those happen when you can't stand on your own two feet financially from a relationship perspective, from a, like a core perspective, when you feel you need somebody else to survive, then you start behaving in a way that compromises who you want to be. And it makes you feel even more less than. And that's not okay. That's not okay. And that is a core reason why we do this. Why every day we build ourselves up. Why we make ourselves help healthy through disciplines. Why we focus on where we want to go in life and make daily strides. I don't want anybody in this group to ever feel like a victim. It's going to happen. You're going to be victimized. I have no doubt. But you should not feel like you should not own the identity of a victim. I want you to do for yourself. Be healthy and drive toward your vision. Take steps to improve yourself. Don't wait for anybody else to do it for you. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen even in a couple of years maybe. Some of us have a lot of progress to make, myself included. But... You have to keep going forward. You have to keep going forward. You have to keep taking those steps. There are times in your life, and there might be times in your life very recently where you felt taken advantage of, where you felt victimized, where you felt like, like, like I don't want to ever feel like this again. And the only way to never feel like that again is to not get yourself in that situation again and to be capable of taking care of yourself, improving yourself, and avoiding anything that looks similar to that. We can't avoid all of it, but we can we can minimize the risk, sort of like the coronavirus thing, right? Minimize your risk of getting into a precarious situation. And that comes with taking care of yourself, doing what's good for yourself. All right, so that's it. That's my, I'm off my soapbox now. That's, I'm off my soapbox. I feel pretty strongly about that. Can you tell? I just, I can't stand it. I think that's one of the things, one of the things that angers me is to see somebody um, that can help themselves not help themselves. And a lot of times it's because people don't see the path. And that's sort of why I'm here. I don't even know precisely where that path is but I know the general direction and that's why I'm here because I think we all need to find our own path and um, the other thing that really pisses me off is seeing other people trying to take advantage of people trying to do their thing right if somebody's working hard and somebody's trying to make themselves better and somebody's trying to do the right thing seeing somebody try to keep that person down really pisses me off and we've even seen it in our business. You know, if anybody's been following, we know, but there's other people in the business that have that have tried to take advantage of us. And, you know, we navigate it. We do what we got to do. We keep fighting. We keep taking steps forward. And that's what we have to do in everything, large and small. You know, people are going to rip us off. People are going to take advantage. People are going to do bad things. We shouldn't compromise our own values for it. And we should always try to keep pushing forward. Did I go deep on you on this Sunday? All right. 
Well, look, I'm going to head out. The weather is nice. Uh, it's going to be almost 60 degrees today. I'm going to get my kids outside, get some fresh air, um, and uh, you know, take advantage of this nice weather. Uh, I hope you have a great Sunday. Uh, I hope this was valuable to you. If you have any questions, if you have any concerns, if you have any feedback, let me know in the comments. I am happy to hear from you. Um, have a great Sunday. Enjoy your day, and I will talk to you tomorrow morning.